Hello, YouTube. I am walking through Paris right now, and I'm on my way to the Louvre, where I am going to meet Chuck Chikoyao, the designer for Solomon that I told you about in my last video that I was going to meet in Paris, which I think is very, very cool. It's been really nice coming back to Paris. I haven't been here in quite a while. I think maybe probably eight years it has changed quite a bit. In my recollection, it wasn't so bikey. Maybe I just never noticed, but it's actually very bike friendly. There are a lot of bike lanes and there's and like really like the bike lanes are bigger than the car, than most of the car lanes actually. And there's bikes everywhere. You can very easily get some rental bikes that are all over the place. And I think it's not necessarily that expensive because it's quite similar to the electric scooters that we have in Holland. But when I told Chuck how much the electric bikes were, he almost fainted. He was comparing it to Shanghai. And apparently renting a bike in Shanghai is like crazy cheap or, or well, or relatively of course, because there it's normal. Because uh, he explained to me, electricity is quite cheap in China. And of course that is because of stuff like that is all government owned and uh, provided. So uh, yeah, you know, for all the commie haters uh, out there, <laughs> but I don't want to start a political discussion. So. Uh, as I was saying, the, the, the bikes are cool. You can easily rent a bike and with an app, pay for it and then just you know, bike around the city. And it's actually quite safe uh, because of all the bike lanes. And like most of the traffic actually is really catered to the biking. And most people actually wear helmets, some quite intricate with, uh, with visors and everything. So uh, people take their safety quite seriously, which is good, I guess, because Dutch people don't really. In in Holland, it's actually really not very cool to wear a helmet, which is too bad because, you know, you got one head, you should probably appreciate it a bit more. I mean, I also don't usually wear a helmet in traffic in Holland. And that's really dumb because I actually did buy one. Anyway, I saw some sites. I went to the Emily in Paris Square where the apartment is and the restaurant, Gabriel's Restaurant. It's actually a really nice square and it wasn't that busy. So uh, it was nice to see that. The weather is not great. Yesterday was actually really hot. We'll probably see some footage of that too. It was really warm yesterday. It's funny because uh, when I talked to Chuck about meeting each other, we talked, to, we made some jokes about that fact that it was going to be so warm on the day that we would meet, that it was not very tech wear. But uh, luckily <laughs> today it's pretty rainy. It's still quite warm actually. So I'm a bit warm and I know Chuck is very, very warm. He's always warm, even wearing just a t-shirt and a shell is really too warm for him right now. And he's going to all these different kinds of shops. But anyway, all I wanted to really say was that I'm on my way and I'm about to meet him and ask him some interesting questions. So, uh, oh, well, well, that's a coincidence. I'm actually <laughs> passing the Solomon shop right now. I think he was here earlier today. Yeah, Solomon shop in Paris. I'm getting a bit out of breath walking with a backpack and talking into a mic, so I am going to stop this. Um, ahem. <laughs> ahem. Hello everyone, I'm here with uh, Chuck, my guest for today. My first guest on my uh, channel ever, actually, so that's uh, quite good. It's a, it's a premiere. Privileged, yeah. privileged to be here. I'm very uh, happy and uh, thankful that you uh, were able to, uh, or and willing to do this <laughs> here on a very wet day in Paris. Uh, so that's very good. So uh, yeah, today I'm here with uh, Chuck, who is a global apparel designer for Solomon. And he has an extensive background in innovative and sustainable outdoor clothing. And Chuck has worked with brands like Kathmandu and has a very deep understanding of the tech world landscape. Uh, so let's dive into his journey uh, and insights. So Chuck, you have uh, built quite an impressive career uh, as a global apparel designer at Solomon. Right, right. Uh, can you share your journey into the world of apparel design and uh, what inspired you to join Solomon? It's talking about the origin story, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was younger, I was a, I was a skater. And I feel that 
like you know streetwear in general was very non-practical yeah yeah i mean skating is still a sport right so you know i thought to myself like why are we wearing this kind of stuff where like it's not practical it looks cool yeah but it's not practical so at a very young age i kind of like always searched for things that like apparel that was more functional like even just for skating you know like um i would wear my sports gear to go skating because i sweat a lot traditional skating gear didn't yeah. really no like cut it a, a cotton tee is not gonna dry and you know and yeah. the uh, after a, uh, a good sweaty skate session so yeah i used to wear active wear you know i'll buy a few sizes bigger so it was still kind of in that have the vibe the 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 baggy vibe yeah that same vibe but it's all like quick dry and like uh, four-way stretch and stuff like that so even back then i was kind of like yearning for uh more functional apparel and when did it get to the point that you chose to yeah to make it your work right? yeah yeah so you know i i i studied design at school it was really organic because of course you don't learn about functional apparel in school you know you don't learn about like outdoor apparel and a lot there's of, no outdoor apparel school <laughs> no there's not so you know a lot of it you learn on the job you know i, I learned a lot of um, my knowledge that i have now when i was at camp mandu in new zealand yeah. was that like the first job you got out of school yeah it was it was the first like proper like outdoor sports apparel company I was straight out of school. Before that, I was at a sportswear company, but it was smaller and it wasn't really not not as not as functional. Did you very specifically look for an outdoor brand or place to work for? I mean, like, um, well, actually, at that time, I mean, New Zealand, there's not really a lot of brands that do apparel in general. So, um, and Kathmandu is basically the biggest one. I mean, if you if you live in Australia or New Zealand, you would know Kathmandu, like. When it rains, most people are wearing Kathmandu rain jackets, and when it's cold, everybody's wearing a Kathmandu down jacket. Basically, yeah, it was only logical for you to end up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when when I found out that there was a position, it was just like a, it was a no-brainer. You know, you know, you have to shoot a shot. You know, you have to give it a go. And um, and how did you make the transition to like well, when did Solomon come into the picture? After quite a few years at Kathmandu. I felt like that there wasn't much more I could learn from that place, so I looked for something else. Yeah, lucky enough, uh, one of my friends was working for Salomon at the time, and and he told me in New Zealand. Uh, no, 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 in, in Shanghai oh, already. Yeah. And then um, and he told me that you know there's a position you should, should just try. I was like, oh, dope. And then I kind of like did a little bit more research on Salomon because at that time Salomon wasn't wasn't as trendy, wasn't as hype. So also maybe not as like well known yeah, in New Zealand. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, wasn't well, as well known in New Zealand, Australia. Because as I told you, like because I'm I'm from Europe. For me, it was yeah. it, it 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 has been a very uh, well known brand for a long time because mm. like everyone who skis in in Europe just you know it's yeah. the, like <laughs> the go to brand for ski wares. Yeah. So I did my research and then like and I was gravitated by how um, innovative, uh, out of the box. Like Salomon Apparel was, yeah, and I was also lucky that uh, yeah, my friend already worked there, so he kind of clued me in on like all the like, yeah. So you had like an in to yeah, yeah, and everything. So I was like, yo, this is this is dope, you know? Yeah, I, I, I want to work there. So yeah, it's, yeah. Understand. it's great, and then, and really good that you got the opportunity to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So designers often draw inspiration from their experiences and like the world around them also influences their creative processes and final products. Can you tell us about one of your favorite designs at Solomon? Uh, like what, what, it, what inspired the piece and how that reflects your design philosophy and, and vision? I think like one of my favorite pieces would be the Bonetti trail jacket. Like the Bonetti franchise is a very well-known franchise in the Salomon trail running. Like in terms of trail running, it's basically like no nonsense. Like everything is considered, everything has to work because you are running for a long time yeah. and you're running in the most harshest terrains. And the thing about the, the Bonetti trail jacket is, uh, first of all, it is a waterproof running jacket yeah. so it's a it's a lightweight three layer 
jacket with seam, like seam sealing. But still, because it's so lightweight, you, it doesn't really hinder your mobility, movement-wise. I mean, like anyone's perception of three-layer like uh, waterproof fabric is yeah. kind of stiff, crunchy, and whatnot. But like uh, the fabric that was picked was definitely uh, enabling uh, runners to, you know, do that activity very well. Was that a Solomon design fabric? Yeah, 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 yeah it is. And then... Um, Does it have a name? I just can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, in terms of like the feature sets, like the hood has uh, auto fit uh, kind of um, functionality uh, with like uh, elasticated um, bands. Auto fit, that sounds like, is it like... Uh... Like back to the future, <laughs> like I mean, like push not, a button, then it goes like okay. yeah. It's not electric. Yeah. It's just kind of like uh, elasticated in certain places, so that when you put it on, it stays on without having you to adjust it. Because as you're running, especially like up in the mountains, conditions change yeah. very rapidly, and you kind of just want to put the jacket on and forget about it and make sure that it works right. And so it kind of adapts to the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like quick. A <laughs> quick deployment. That's yeah. Pretty, pretty sick. Yeah. Also, because of how lightweight the fabric is, like it's super packable as well. Um, so one of the signatures of the Bonatti jacket is the is the chest pocket, and the whole jacket packs into that chest pocket for every Bonatti jacket, whether it be Bonatti trail jacket or Bonatti waterproof jacket, and so on. So that's another like kind so of key it feature. Comes package. Yeah. So you can like pack it into into the pocket itself, and it's really small and and compact. And then uh, one of the last cool features of that jacket is uh, the, the pleating system. So there is um, front pleats like uh, near, the, near the shoulder points. First it's for movement so that it kind of, that's, it kind of creates volume so yeah. that you know when you're not moving it kind of goes back but when you're moving it creates that volume because it's pleated. Uh, secondly, when you're wearing a hydration vest, you know you have like your bulky bits at the front yeah. and then you also have your bulky bits at the back. So it also expands over the hydration vest because you have your pleats where it creates a volume. And then, um, and then also on the back, there's also back pleats as well for to create that volume to cover to cover that hydration vest. So you're like, bam, on. Oh, it it sounds actually really quite intricate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it's very considered. Like it's uh, a lot of uh, athlete feedback and you know what they want and. Um, and that's also one reason why I really enjoy it. So in, in like a testing phase, you mean like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, based on testing and just general feedback of what athletes want. That, that is also one reason why I really enjoy the design process because it's all about solving problems. And it's not like you, you, you have this one thing and then that's it. It's, it's the whole process of yeah, yeah. getting mm -hmm. to the best solution for that problem, right? Yeah, it is. It is a lot of times trial and error. And uh, a lot of times it's definitely not like, oh, okay, I've designed this, this is it. It's, I designed this, I get a proto, I get a prototype, and then test it, and then go back, make comments, have a second prototype, tweak it a bit more, put in the final touches, and then off to the market. Yeah. Amazing. With the growing consumer awareness about like environmental impact and uh, sustainability has become a cornerstone in fashion, right? And particularly in the techwear genre where uh, performance meets eco-responsibility. Mm -hmm. Given your work with the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, uh, how does this collaboration influence your design approach at Solomon, especially in creating eco-friendly techwear, so to speak? I mean, it's just, sustainability is a, is a big word, um, you know, and it can mean a lot of things. And I think in terms of Salomon, you know, for us is kind of sourcing responsible materials and also trying not to create more materials. Yeah. You know, whether that be using recycled polyester and also uh, more sustainable nylon, using less uh, elastane because you know elastane is quite hard to break down right trying to not use mixed material fabrics because, because like, also that's harder than yeah that's harder to, to recycle yeah. you know all those things you know is part of our sustainability goals what exciting materials or technologies i'm gonna do this again take two because it was the sound of the police so i'm gonna <laughs> The question. Yeah. <laughs> we gotta go, we gotta go, bye. With the techwork community values advanced materials that enhance both performance and style. What 
exciting materials or technologies are you currently exploring and how do they contribute to the functionality and appeal of your tech work design? I actually did a project for Kathmandu that used Earth Colors. Yeah. Yeah, so that was very exciting. Earth Colors is using food waste as a dye stuff uh, process. It uses less water and of course it's using food waste. So there's no waste. It's like double, yeah. yeah. The dyed colors come out really dope. It's really different. It's almost like a distressed, kind of a little bit of a, like a faded kind of color. Right. Very, very organic, very natural. And uh, as you wear it and wash it, it kind of, um, yeah, fades like a fine denim, which is really, really dope. Also a bit like, like colors also, like Stone Island stuff, it has a lot of the... Yeah, yeah, they kind of like wash look, yeah. right? Yeah, it, lo it looks like it has history. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was yeah, that was very that was very fun, and I learned a lot about uh, natural dyeing process. There's a lot of inconsistent beauty to the fabrics. A lot of wabi sabi. Yeah, a lot of it, and <laughs> like because it, it it's dyed in batches. Yeah. You know, like you know, fabric is dyed in batches, so that um, each batch may vary slightly, and, um, making it unique. unique yeah. yeah. But like it was something that we had to educate the consumer about or else they're going to get a tea and they'll be like, why I, is it weird? I, I see more and more sometimes like in, in the description of pieces on, on when you buy like on internet, it says like the color or it can differ from, you know, yeah. there's like a disclaimer about that. that yeah, it, differ from the photo yeah, or exactly. something like that. Yeah, 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 for sure. They don't all look exactly like this one. Yes, can, yes, yes. In the tech wear uh, realm, Clothing must be practical yet stylish, catering to urban explorers who demand versatility. How do you navigate the challenge of ensuring your designs are both functional for outdoor activities and visually appealing to tech wear enthusiasts? I think like in terms of in terms of Salomon, like um, of course functionality is always gonna be at the forefront of the design ethos. Yeah. Because um, yeah, Salomon's always been about innovation and, and functionality. It's like in the core of the brand, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. You can't just go <laughs> It can't just look good, you know? Yeah. Like, it's how you balance between it being functional and also aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like, um, that's one of the hardest things to do because sometimes functional things are not pretty. A lot of outdoor brands, you know, they might make high performance gear. Yeah but it's not something everyone can wear. Have there been moments where you have been in like a decision of, okay, we're gonna go for one versus the other because they, oh, couldn't, yeah. they couldn't be both? <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Like, you know, my, I mean, my, my benchmark has always been like, like in terms of styles, like, will I wear it? But there is sometimes designs that you just won't wear yourself, but it's super functional. And it's for that high end performance consumer. Do you remember any very specific? I mean, like I, I designed um, one of the one of the lightest uh, running insulated jackets for the running range. Yeah, it's called uh, Sense Sense Flow jacket. So it uses Taijin Okta. Taijin's a Japanese uh, fabric brand. Yeah. So Taijin Okta is kind of like Alpha Direct, but um, it's not as high lofted, but it's still like a mesh insulation. And it's called Okta because the fibers are made to look like it's kind of like spread out like octopuses, like like oh, like, right. octo, like octopi, sorry. <laughs> and it's a hollow, it's a hollow fiber, so it's very warm but it's very light. Yeah, yeah. So I did that, I did that jacket, and uh, and the insulation was not all over the jacket. It was sectioned where the vital parts of your body is warm. Yeah, and where you need a lot of like uh, ventilating or a lot of like heat exhaustion there's no insulation and uh, I, I really like that jacket because it's so lightweight however because a lot of runners don't need hand pockets or no it has yeah. to be a, it has to be a certain fit like I'm a wide dude you know like I, I can't and and I like I designed it I couldn't wear it because it was like first of all it was too tight yeah. It was a really tight, like a like a size medium or even a size at large was too too tight for me. The fit because of the fit. Yeah. And then secondly, like if I'm wearing a jacket, I need hand pockets. So so yeah, it was like one of those things where like super dope. Like 
as a lightweight insulation piece, as a transseasonal type of piece, amazing. But like uh, for my personal wear, it was just just. But um, it's it's more of a performance piece. Yeah, it was a, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely on the performance side was, and less the tech wear where or like the the more urbany side of apparel. Yeah. Yeah. Designing high performance apparel comes with unique challenges, particularly when it's trying to balance durability, functionality and style. What are some of the biggest challenges you face as a designer in the tech wear industry and especially concerning performance and sustainable practices? Well, I mean like uh, in terms of sustainability, you know, there's certain chemicals that we don't use. They are not sustainable, like for our for our DWR and, and and also for our membrane. Yeah. In terms of like hard shell, we have a sustainability officer. He is in charge of making yeah. sure that everything. It's not really you. You as a designer are yeah. not really the person that. I mean, if you think of something that is not like according to, then you'll hear it, right? Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I'll, I'll hear from that yeah. guy. That guy will tell you. Yeah, yeah. And, no. also like, uh, <laughs> and also, like, and also, like, my uh, fabric technician will select fabrics based on or sustainability goals yeah. uh, that's set by the sustainability officer. So, the, so the boundaries there are will be set for you, and yeah. you as a designer are just to work within these boundaries, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. As the tech world landscape continues to evolve. Uh, understanding its future direction is crucial for a designer aiming to innovate. Looking ahead, where do you envision the future of TechWare heading, uh, particularly in terms of sustainability and technological advancements in apparel? I think in terms of the future, of course, every fabric that we use, everything that we do, will need to have sustainability involved. Like uh, you know, whether whether it be using recycled materials or bio-based materials, renewable resources, I think there's still a lot of innovating that needs to be done to make sure that we have truly sustainable materials and fabrics to work with. Basically, it's, it's still a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, they, they, I mean, they, there's still a lot of work to do. But uh, the thing is that we are slowly but surely getting there, which is which is really good. Um, and at least it's. A thing like people oh, yeah, are actually yeah. trying, and you know, it's an awareness yeah. um, that people do have uh, in terms of uh, you know the industry and consumers. So uh, that's that's really good. Even from when I started in the industry till now, yeah, there, there has been a quite a, a big of, change in yeah, a in a changes. relatively short time, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of changes. Yeah, for sure. So with the techwear community uh, rapidly expanding, aspiring designers are eager to learn from established professionals in the field. So what advice would you offer the young designers aspiring to break into the tech wear industry? Maybe things that you I mean, wish like, you had known. Like what would you tell your your younger self? Like what kind of advice would you have for your younger self? I mean, I guess like if I if I had to give some advice would be to start as soon as you can, you know? Like uh, even if it's just and by start, you mean start educating yourself in terms of uh, what you need to do, like to become a good designer. Because I feel like um, being a designer is a state of mind where you learn how to create ideas and also manifest the result yeah. and solve problems. And a lot of times, to solve problems, you need a lot of knowledge. Yeah. So you really need to be educated and know in which situation to use what solution to resolve an issue. So basically, just get good. Just no, get to know stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean like, yeah. Just, just be curious. If you don't know something, find out until you know. Answer your own questions, yeah. right? Find your answers. Yeah. Because when I was young, the internet was slow. Yeah. There wasn't as much resources for me to use. Where's now, man? Like, finger. It's all there. Yeah, at your fingertips. Yeah. You have everything. You know, yeah. you want to learn about fabrics. You want to learn about, uh, you know, what, like a snow jacket needs. It's all there. Like everything is there. So you can really, really start a lot earlier. Like, you don't have to start 
when you go to university, you could no, start. There's, really, there's really no excuse to be ignorant in 20, no. 2024, right? <laughs> no, there isn't. Learn as much as you can. Absorb everything. And then I think like the last bit of advice I'll give is don't turn down a challenge. Like, don't just see a challenge and be like, oh, no, nah, I can't do this. You know, I feel like that's how that's how I grew the most is when there's some there's a challenge and there's something that I've never done before. Then that's when you grow, because if you haven't done it before, you'll learn very quickly how to do it. And that's part of what you say, that this is like a, it's a state of mind, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And like, I think like, the best designers are designers that stay curious, just want to learn everything. You know, all of a sudden you think of, oh, why, why is this, why is this thing? Or why is that? And then you go and just search it up. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah you, you really need to want to know, right? Yeah, exactly. And as a designer, you should want to know everything. Yeah, I think you should, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Chuck, for your, <laughs> for your insights and uh, your time and uh, willingness to uh, talk with me about techware on this uh, very <laughs> wet... <laughs> what is it, Wednesday? Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Thursday night in, in, in Paris. It was really nice to come here and, and meet you. Mm -hmm. that, that's for sure, <laughs> one thing. Nice to meet and, you uh, too. Even like, uh, besides this interview, it was like, very interesting and cool to hang out with you for two days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've been days. hanging out quite a bit uh, yeah. in the past two days, so uh, it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys uh, learned something today. Uh, if you have any questions, please do uh, let me know in the comments below. Maybe I can uh, answer them uh, later and or ask Chuck again. again. We'll do it with the teams, yeah. teams Q and A. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks for watching. If if this kind of content is something uh, you guys enjoy, do let me know, and I'll uh, try to do more of these kind of interview uh, settings. I mean, this was actually the first interview I ever did. <laughs> yeah, I uh, actually think it's kind of fun. So yeah, uh, it's a lot of fun. Bonsoir. <laughs> Bye, you too. Cool.